all good? Okay, uh, welcome everyone, thanks for coming here. Uh, I took a flight two days ago and uh, I'm still having like some, uh, the results of the flight and I'm kind of dizzy, so I mean, sorry if I talk like uh, a zombie. Uh, it's just uh, too early in the morning for me right now after a flight. Uh, rocket intern experience, what does it mean? Uh, I have my agenda, which is kind of ugly. Um, I'm going to introduce how we've built uh, our team and our technology in one of Rocket Internet's venture. How many of you know what Rocket Internet is? Okay, a few of them. Uh, some might have good opinions, some might have like biased opinions or bad opinions, it's fine. Rocket Internet is a European incubator that is launching ventures all over the world. Um, we took like very good ideas, uh, you can say like Amazon, uh, Amazon style uh, businesses and we launched them in places, in countries where they don't have those businesses. I personally live and work in Dubai, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the experience that we've had at Namshi, which is one of the ventures of Rocket in the Middle East. To give you some context, I started working there after like two and a half years of being a lead developer in Rome, uh, in my home country, Italy. Uh, I started there like, yeah, almost two years ago. It's, it's been like more than uh, one and a half years of being working there. And when I joined, uh, the team was, was, just, uh, was just formed. We were like around 15, 20 people in the technical, the technical part of the ventures. We had two ventures. So let's say 10 people were working on one of our projects and 10 people and other 10 people were working on Namshi, which, which is the project that I was leading back, back at the time. You have to imagine, these are our, our online retailers. We actually sell shoes and clothes and so on. Um, and we do the technical part behind that, okay? It's basically just a product, okay? So you're working on a PHP stack for a product. We sell shoes. That's it. Uh, well, what were my responsibilities when I joined there? Um, I come from very, like, probably I would say biased background, um, where we used to do TDD like all the time uh, back in Rome. I was working for an agency called DNC, uh, and it was pretty good. We were used to work with Symphony. Symphony 1 back at the time was still 2009. Uh, Symphony 2 was, was released like much later. Uh, everything was tested, everything was proper. And then I joined Rocket, okay? And I thought, okay, it's a product, uh, it's a startup. Uh, who cares, we're gonna do the same things. We're gonna strive towards excellence, right? And actually what they told me is like, no, no, not at all. I mean, the first thing that you have to do is make things work which is the most important thing in any business, okay? So you can say, yeah, I'm a technician, I wanna do things my way. No, go Lord, uh, you're gonna do things our way. Because uh, what do we have to do at the end of the day? It's just sell, okay? It's just sell products. And uh, you know, some managers would tell you, I don't care how we sell them, uh, as, long as, the, as long as we make a sale, as long as the user purchases something, it's fine. No matter if behind that thing we have uh, WordPress or whatever. So in that context, I felt kind of uh, in pain, you know? Because um, TDD for me was useless, because automated, automated tests were useless, and, and Symphony 2 was useless. It was one and a half years ago. I said, okay, I want to introduce these things here. And they were eager to start, you know? Um, thing is, the management was kind of open to like, let's say, Okay, let's rebuild some stuff, uh, but we still have a product that has to go on and, and, and sell, right? Uh, and so the situation was kind of ideal, but the problem is that, yeah, even here in Europe, it might be easy to find people and to train them, or today, if, I'm, if I ask you, like, how many of you have ever worked with Symfony or Silex or a Zen framework, every one of you probably would have, uh, would have tried them at least once in their life, right? There, it's different, it's Asia, okay? Um, where technology, at least in the PHP side of it, it's still way behind uh, what it should be, where it should be. So the first thing is people, okay? So you gotta get a team, and I was hired probably like at last. So everyone was hired before me with their background, uh, good or bad it can be, I mean, I, I'm not here to judge. Uh, and what you have to do is, okay, let's use Symfony 2, good. How many of you have used Symfony 2? Never. How many of you have ever tested code? Uh, no. And it's kind of difficult at that point. 
the first thing that we have to do is to form the team, right? And how did we do it? Um, I would have loved to just get some of my some of my buddies from Rome and get them to Dubai. I think it might be that those those don't want to come there. They have families or whatever. They just don't come. And you can't say like, okay, I'm going to be the next GitHub. Let's uh, let's distribute everything because your management will tell you, well, no, we want to have developers in house and so on. So uh, what were the key points for us to hire a very good, a very strong team in the Middle East? I'm not talking about Europe or whatever, I'm talking about the Middle East. I mean, some of those principles, you can apply them even for whatever company all around the world. Uh, those are just like kind of words of wisdom that I learned the hard way. The first thing is to hire young people. And uh, why would you say? Uh, it's easy, because they forget about their watches, okay, when it's 6 o'clock, they don't care. If they're working on Node.js, they're going to work on that until 4 a.m., which is good for both the employer and the employee, because he learns, and you get a lot of production and productivity, right? And there is no big bias. Can you imagine, like, you get one developer that has worked for, like, five years on Zen Framework 1 or WordPress, okay? If you try to get them, to make them fit inside the Symfony 2 context, it's going to be such a pain in the ass, okay? Because the thing is, they have their structure, their, they have their mindset, and it's really difficult to change afterwards. So if you are, hire someone who's fresh graduate or so on, uh, for them it's very easy, because they don't know shit, okay? So they're just like, okay, just give me whatever, and I'll learn it. Ignore all the CVs that they give you. Like, CVs volume zero for me. Thing is, uh, we're in the Middle East, uh, and we get a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of shitload of uh, curriculums uh, from people from Pakistan, India, that part, the subcontinent. Okay. The thing is, how many PHP companies do I know that work in India? Maybe one. Okay. And how many of them do you know? Do you know any PHP company in India? Zero, right? So why the fuck would I look at your CV, right? I think it's very easy. Uh, I want to know about your experience, but not on the paper. I want to know on the ground what you did, right? We are biased. I mean, we have companies like Sensio, uh, PHP companies, and uh, whatever, KNP. And it's easy, you know, we go there and we're like, okay, we want to hire someone from those companies. Yeah, if you're in the US, or maybe if you're in France, that might work. It doesn't work if you're like, over there in Dubai, because you have to tell people, yeah, come here first. And the problem is, all the application that you will get will not come from those companies, okay? So it will come from like very small or mid-sized agencies, and people, and people will just tell you, okay, I work here, here, here in this project, yeah, so what? I really don't do anything with, uh, with, with that experience. You want to learn, you want to learn what they've done through their GitHub profile, right? You want to learn what I've done like, through like, a code challenge, uh, which I don't, I don't personally like coding challenges uh, when you hire people, but uh, that's what they did uh, with me as well. And it might work in that case. And then, uh, one of the things that I really, really fight for is to, is to work overtime. And you know why? Because I will tell you later what we're working on. Uh, but basically, I love to just spend time at work I love to wake up on Saturday morning and say, okay, can I do something uh, today? Because we work on stuff that it's kind of interesting, okay? So partial overtime is what I define. It's, um, it's not overtime when you have to change labels or you have, where you have to do stupid things like, okay, let's change the background color of this, uh, of this item and so on. No, it's like, look, man, I hired you. I want you to work on Symfony 2. It's nice, okay, because we all agree it's kind of nice. Uh, you never worked on it before, so I will give you the time to train, to get trained and learn. But you also have to give me some more time where you actually work your ass off and after 6 o'clock, right? Like training is a cost that it's, it's not good to, to just carry on on one of the sides of the business. 
So it's not either the employee has to go to a conference and has to pay for everything, or the employer has to pay you for everything, and at 6 o'clock you can leave. No, I mean, it's, it's a cost that you can split, and it's very easy at that point, because it's, it's a trade-off that you want to make, right? You give your people the freedom to work on stuff that actually um, stimulates them, that motivates them, and they give you like some extra effort. And as I said, if you spend time changing labels in overtime, you might want to look for another job. Because that's not the way you should do it. Maybe it might be that just before an important release, you'll have to do it. Okay, that's fine, once in a while, but not every time, not systemically. As I said, it's a matter of what you give and what you get in those extra, extra hours. And then the parameter interview. Um, it's one thing that I always do with candidates. It's, it's nothing, uh, it's not rocket science. It's just one thing, something that I really like to do. It's to start asking questions and um, to be able to define until which point a candidate can follow you, or you can follow it if it's better, um, of course. So it basically consists of like just asking a like, uh, top-down list of questions and see where the candidate stops. Uh, usually my first one is, who is Frederick Brooks? Do you know who this guy is? This old guy is? Which sucks. I mean, Frederick Brooks, um, was the main architect behind the OS 360, one of the first IBM monsters. Um, and in one of his books, he's basically one of the fathers of computer science. In one of his books, he talks about the mythical man month. Do you know what the mythical man month is? No, but for sure, you know that you can't make one baby with nine months in a month, right? And this guy is the guy who said that. Okay, he for the first time he talked about he spoke about delay like adding manpower to a software project that it's late will make it later, will delay it furthermore. Okay, why? Because you add extra chances of communication. So we're late one week with our projects. Okay, let's get fifty Indians. So let's work on that. No, because you have to coordinate those people. It's not that you're gonna like, if you double your manpower, you're gonna cut down the costs because that manpower comes at the extra cost. And this is the guy who for the first time said, look guys, in computer science, it doesn't work like this. You just, you just don't double the people and you get it like enough of time. So this would be one of my first questions. Um, and he's one of the guys who actually thought, uh, spoke for the first time about pair programming. We're talking about 43 years ago, 43 years ago. My dad was like this 43 years ago, and I wasn't even born. I probably was just a thought. He spoke about pair programming when he was describing um, how you should operate like a surgery task on, uh, on patients when you, when you, uh, when you actually go, where, when, where you have someone who's actually doing, who's cutting the skin. Okay, it doesn't sound very good at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, it's cutting the skin. And you have someone has observes and have a, has a look at the, uh, uh, take a look, takes a look at the big picture and says, okay, we're going in the right direction or not. And it's the same thing that you have in pair programming. There is someone who codes there on the spot, and there is someone uh, right behind who was watching it and was keeping a look at the whole picture, right? At the broader picture. So yeah, this guy is, is kind of important. It's not a big deal if, you, if we don't know him, but it's always appreciated too. Do you know what is the second system effect? No one? Just say no. No, 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 no. Jesus Christ, yeah. <laughs> Good. So that guy, Frederick Burks, uh, what he did, since he was that smart, he coined for the first time the term second system effect. Do you remember Netscape? OK. I don't, because I wasn't surfing the internet back at the time. But basically, what happened is Second ver version of Netscape Navigator had to be perfect. What they said is like, okay, we're gonna redo it, and we're gonna put all of the missing features that we had before. And so it starts, it, the projects start to get delayed, and delayed, and more features are added to Netscape, okay? And it gets delayed, and it gets delayed, and it gets delayed. And you know how it ends? Firefox. Who remembers about Netscape right now? Who uses it anymore? The second system effect consists in having a first prototype of your project, redesigning the second one, knowing what the problem of the first one were, 
and just adding a pile, a pile, of pile of features that make it undeliverable, okay? Because it takes too much time. And then you have no time to market, and then it comes to Mozilla. Releases Firefox and you're screwed. What does this acronym mean? Any one of you know it? Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture. It's a series of, of patterns, like the data mapper, okay? That uh, would be used in enterprise application. There are two main authors behind this. I mean, there is a good post by, I think it's uh, uh, Ken Beck, who summarizes them. Uh, and there, is another, and there is another book by either Beck or Fowler, uh, I hope you know them, uh, that describes these patterns. So these are patterns that are not very common. Uh, like how many of you use Data Mapper in, in your daily work? One, two, a few of them. I mean, you don't use it every time, right? So these are kind of, uh, these are kind of patterns that are use, useful when you lean towards like enterprise application architectures, okay? What is the Data Mapper? Who knows what is the data mapper? What is it? Just data to relational objects. Data to relational objects. Now, really, it's domain to, to, to persistence. So basically, you have your own domain. I mean, it's kind of, it's really difficult, especially if I ask you the question on the spot. Uh, you know, you have your domain objects. Uh, we might be car, person, whatever. And then you have to persist them in the, in the DB. So active record, what does active record does? I hate active record. It maps every attribute of that, of that uh, domain entity to a DB column, which is not always the case for your domain. So you might want to have an attribute of that domain entity on another table and so on. Data Mapper lets you do it, okay? It doesn't have a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping towards the DB, towards the persistence layer. So it decouples the domain from its persistence. Why is it cool? Because of this. Because you can have a really decoupled domain model. Why is object-oriented uh, programming better than procedural code? One of the very last questions that I would ask. And what happens when you hit enter on the browser bar? And you go, you go, I said, it's a top-down approach. So you start asking some questions that are, might be more tricky, that might be trickier and then you end up with like simpler stuff. And so on and so on. Surprise them. You know, when you have a candidate that comes to your interview, uh, it's always good to, to make them feel like uh, not really comfortable. Uh, given that you can actually teach stuff with an interview, because look, the interview is a learning process for the guy who's coming uh, there. Because you have to teach him. If you're just gonna ask him stuff and then send him away, you will have the impression that you're an asshole, and you would be, okay? Uh, you have to teach them, because even if you're not gonna hire them, even if you're not rewarding them with a job offer, you'll have to give, give them a good impression and make them uh, feel that that moment, that hour that they dedicate to you, it's not wasted, okay? How many of you have you ever gone to an interview and like, oh, okay, just time that I wasted? Yeah, you don't want to be like that when you're a manager, okay? So what I like to surprise people is just they wear shorts. So right now, I'm, since I'm freezing my ass in this country, I have trousers. But usually I just wear shorts. Because, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's warmer in Dubai. Or why don't you ask them how many cabs are there? How many cabs are there in Paris? Thing is, they don't know, okay? For sure they don't know. But at least their reasoning, their mindset, will let you understand how they would come to a solution. Because let's be honest, if in your daily work, you go like, okay, I know perfectly how I'm gonna do this task. Let's get this model, let's code this, let's write a task. It doesn't work like this. Usually it's, it's like, shit, how do I do this? Okay, that's usually how it works, right? <coughs> and for them it's the same. When you're at an interview, you just have to make them feel uncomfortable. Because uh, then you will see how they will perform in the in situation where they're, where they're uh, under pressure. And that's it. Make them, put them in a no comfort zone. And the good thing, if you wear shorts, is that you gain authority on the field. So look, I'm 25, okay? I just turned 25. I'm vice president of this company, okay? 
And I get authority on the field, not on paper. I don't like to tell people what my position is or whatever when we get into the interview, because I don't care. I want them to respect me because of what I told them during the interview. That's the most important part. You remember people not to be judgmental, because they're going to say, oh, there's just this kid, it's just interviewing them. Then you smash them, and they understand they don't have to be judgmental. And you can go to the beach afterward, sorry. The last important thing is to offer fair packages. I've seen this uh, being done in a few, quite a few companies, and, uh, and it's really important that people don't find out that they're underpaid, right? Because it, it, it makes them feel undervalued, and, and it, it makes them undervalued. Uh, so one of the key points for us and for everyone should be, okay, pay as much as you should pay. It's not that if someone from India comes and says, okay, I'll, I'll work for you for 500 euros per month. No, it's not cool. You just tell them, These are, this is our range of salaries, and you should be working at this rate. Because someone will ask more, someone will ask less, but you have to be fair towards everyone. Yeah, at the end of it, you get a lot of colors in this picture. Um, and this, is, this was our team back in, uh, I think, January this year, something like that. Uh, during one of those long nights where we had to work a lot. Uh, you get your team and you have to get it started, right? Uh, so what are you going to work on? When I first got there, they told me, look man, it takes three months to be effectively productive on our software. And I was like, why? And what they told me is like, oh, because developers usually don't understand the code. Okay, so I said, okay, the solution is very easy. Let's fire them all. Okay. Shit, but we've just hired them. Okay, so we can't really do it. Probably the, the problem is lies somewhere else, right? Um, okay, why don't they understand the code? What's the problem there? Okay, because the code is not that domain-driven. You, know, um, you know what a domain-driven design is? Yes, no? Okay. So we're not, uh, this is the time left or the time spent? Left? Because the code is not domain driven, it's not very easy to find out what's, uh, what's doing behind all those classes. Okay, let's replace the software entirely. So in four months, what we did, it was to rewrite our entire architecture from like a monolith with PHP, we just used uh, Ruby on Rails and Node.js, and our company failed, because we couldn't deliver any feature in the meanwhile. That's why we didn't do it, okay? You have to always have a look at the cost-benefit ratio. So you can't drop your know-how and your tools, because we have already have a software that works that is handling like a, an e-commerce portal. We can't just say, okay, we don't like it that much, or we might be able to do something better, or uh, we want to make it better. Okay, you can't replace it from scratch, because you're going to have a time to market, which is awful. Then ask yourself, what is the codomain driven? Because no one here is able to write the couple DDD, okay? Which is fine. I mean, you just tired them, right? You have to train them. You can imagine, Fabian, if he, if he was your boss and like on your first job, it would rip you apart, right? But we were all born some kind of noobs, right? So that's kind of fine. It's not a big deal. Uh, you have to teach people and you have to be patient. That's cool. Just have what Socrates um, in the ancient Greece was, was, was doing, uh, the Socratic approach. You question something. You say, okay, guy, uh, I, don't really, I don't really like how you're doing this thing. Um, raise your thoughts. Because I think we might be able to perform better if you use this implementation. Let them elaborate. It might be that they're going to accept your, uh, your reasons, your uh, motivations, uh, your reasons, uh, but it might be that they don't. So let's throw them together. Let's go to production or to staging with this code. It doesn't perform and boom, it just explodes on staging. Okay, accept the evidences. So now you've seen that it breaks everything, right? I'm ready to move on for the next issue. But never tell people, no, this is shit, it doesn't work because they don't understand how, why it doesn't work. And then, in a week, they're going to make the same mistake. So, as a manager, you failed. Because you can't train people. 
That's what I call the BAB approach, which sucks. It's because it's better. No, there's no because it's better. You want to change, you want to change people to, to get things better. No, that's wrong. Because you're going to stick with people for like one or two years. And you want, you want them to grow in those one or two years. You don't want to repeat the same thing. So you want to change things so that people get better, right? Then mutate. Uh, this is the software part of it. Um, what we did, so we come from like a, a Zen framework and EA arch architecture. It's kind of decoupled, uh, meaning that we have a front end and a back end. Uh, we, well, we, we saw that there were like a lot of limitations. So we, we thought like, okay, let's implement something else on top, of, uh, on top of what we already have. If we have new features, we might be able to, to redo some stuff. So in three months, imagine you have this entire architecture and you don't know anything about it. The first thing that we did, okay, let's, let's integrate Monolog. That is Jordi, as, as you might know. Uh, let's integrate Monolog to get some more deep insights about logging and so on. And let's start using the Symfony 2 components. Not Symfony 2, because it would be like, let's rewrite the entire application. And that's not possible at the time. It's just like, let's use the Symfony components for doing this, request, uh, the finder, and stuff like that. Then it's easier. And in the meanwhile, people get used to those kind of PHP libraries. So when they're going to transition to Symfony 2, for them it's going to be like, oh, yeah, easy. I've already used this shit. In six months, that was in, three, in a three months uh, time frame. In six months, we moved to AWS. Uh, we shifted our entire development of GitHub. And we started integrating with Cloudflare and later Noistar for DDoS protection. Uh, in nine months, what we've decided to do is like, OK, for a lot of things, Let's abandon uh, PHP, raw PHP, and Chrome's. Let's have messaging that works, OK? With Zeroam Q. Uh, then we integrated some monitoring tools like Graylog. Have you ever used Graylog? No? It's a very good uh, log analyzer, real-time log analyzer. You just, you just log anything, and you send it to Graylog. It's pretty good. And you can divide your, uh, your logs and streams. We've integrated some more people. In a year, we decided, OK, let's do one thing. Let's go SOA, service-oriented architecture. Uh, we introduced, we introduced after a year, it was this difficult. We introduced automated testing through BHAT in a year, and we shifted from zero MQ, which sucks for like a bunch of reasons, to RabbitMQ. And then, in one and a half years, I can happily say that two weeks ago, um, we just released uh, our mobile website uh, with uh, AngularJS. We're using Speedy. Oh, we just integrated Speedy. It's actually on the go. The guys are integrating it right now. Um, and we moved to Travis for, uh, for, um, for continuous integration. And this is, this is the big picture that you get from a company that starts from kind of a legacy architecture and wants to really shift and to change the paradigm. All besides the day-to-day -day development. I mean, there is a bug. Let's fix it. And then we have all these this long-term projects, right? Uh, in three months, we were doing one deployment a week, then one deployment a day, then two, three deployments a day. Then we, we realized, okay, let's slow down, let's do one, two deployments per week. I didn't really know where to get the number. Because it was like so much painful, let's deploy every time, let's deploy once a week, let's have sprints. Let's just deploy one whenever stuff is ready. Okay? And that's the only thing that actually works for us. You get a ticket, it makes sense to deploy it, let's have it in production. That's it, like that easy. And SOA, how many of you know service-oriented architectures? Good. So we decided, okay, let's go SOA, because it makes much more sense for us if we want to replace stuff um, in, the underlying, in the underlying architecture. Let's just replace components and one component here and one component here. So instead of replacing our entire architecture that would be like uh, a killer for the business, we just said, okay, let's replace one piece here, one piece there. This is called doing a service-oriented architecture where your paradigm changes. So you're not thinking in terms of an application, but you're thinking in terms of services. What is it? It's basically a software design that lets you integrate a few services together with web services, with asynchronous messages, or other things, that to all together provide your application, your entire architecture's functionalities, okay? 
it's very hard to get it like the first time, but then it's very easy to see it like in like on the spot. What do you do tomorrow is you start a new PHP project, right? And you do everything with one application. That's it, you have a container, it's a front and back, and it does everything on its own. Then you have to do your chat system, something like that. And you say, okay, PHP, it's not the good solution for that. So what you do is, let's do it in Java, which I don't think is a good solution, but whatever. Okay, so you do another part of your application, and what they share probably is the user base. So they're gonna uh, have a mechanism that integrates users from the chat to the website, right? And then you say, look man, we wanna, we wanna separate the front end, because I think we're gonna put all the data in Redis from the back end. The back end will work on MySQL, and then we'll also put all the data in Redis, so that the front end can just read it from Redis, which is way faster. Okay, so you already have three services in your architecture, and then, when you, actually, when you actually have to scale up, you just say, I don't care, I'll just add three machines, either, either two front end machines, and I'm fine. No matter how many users I'll get, it's not a problem. Because I divided those layers, and I can get iCPU machines from Amazon for my front end that uses CPU, and optimize the cost for that. It's really uh, sharpening technology. And then you said, okay, we did our chat in Java. And your lead architect comes to you and tells you, look, man, it probably wasn't a good idea for a bunch of reasons. So he says, but I've heard of this stuff, and we can do it with something like kind of different, a little bit more funky, uh, but it works in real time. It's no JS, which is kind of scary the first time you have a look at it. And if you have to maintain a no JS application, how? It's your problem, not mine. So then you say, okay, I'm just going to replace my Java layer, my chat layer, with something funky like Node.js. That's it. You're not rewriting your architecture. You're rewriting the service. It's isolated. As long as the interfaces are okay, you don't break anything. Nothing changes. So you have like four-fifths of your architecture that are still there, still working. And you just replace one, you completely replace one of, the, one of the services without changing anything at the architectural level. So yeah, in human understandable words, SOA is just, let's take one piece of functionality and let's isolate it in a, in a completely separate uh, layer. That's it. I'm gonna, get, uh, I'm gonna get notification with a web service, I'm gonna get data with uh, ORM access, direct access to DB, whatever. It's just, let's split the components. For example, we have a back-end service in Zen Framework, okay? And we have a new front-end uh, front uh, application that comes out in Angular, okay? How are they gonna, how are they gonna deal with the, with the data? Well, for example, the Zen application might just use Doctrine. Or maybe we have another application that provides um, HTTP web services for the Angular front-end, and it just, it just shares the domain model with the Zen Framework application by Doctrine because you have a data mapper, so you can write your own brand new entities, entities, even if you have like a legacy application with the doctrine where I'm mapping. See, and it might be that you, that you just use web services for your Angular JS application, or, you know, you might want to raise an event. For example, the user goes to the website, it purchases something, you send an event to RabbitMQ, and Rabbit tells, another service completely separate. Look, the user has just purchased this thing. Why don't you send him an email with the recap of his order? <coughs> That's how it works. And then you can monitor if there's a problem with tools like New Relic, very recommended, highly recommended, we had for just doing tests, or Protractor, which is the, which is the testing framework for AngularJS, and, uh, and Gradle, Gradle 2. Yeah, there is a problem in all of this, that no one is designing web services for you anymore. So you have to be very careful about your, the design of your architecture. Like interfaces between components then are very crucial. Software design is crucial. Don't just limit yourself to develop things, but engineer them. It's one of the most important things. It's not I'm gonna develop this and who cares in three months, it's I'm gonna develop this and I have to interface it with this thing again in six months when we're gonna implement this new stuff, and it has to work. Of course, you can change things, but it's important that you don't screw the design from the beginning. Sixth point, very important, you get uh, 
a company of uh, a team of 12, a company of almost 200 people delegate stuff, release management, let, let people do that. Um, maintenance, like to verify that the bug is there, just, just delegate one of your team members. Um, product management is the same thing, just advise on product management, okay? And delegation in short terms means that uh, you have faster cycles. So if I have to verify every bug that comes in, it will take me so much time. If, if anyone in the team can do it, it's just a, like a matter of like 15, 20 minutes of feedback and then you're there. Uh, more time to pair and teach, at least for the people who should actually do those tasks, like uh, bug reporting and, and everything. And then the most important thing is that you have committed team members, uh, which is always a good thing. Because you actually give them the responsibilities that you would have. I know it's more Friday morning, so everyone is kind of uh, tired. Uh, introduction at the end, as I always like to do, because there are always so many things and uh, time is running out. Uh, my name is Alex. Uh, you can find me at this very unfriendly Twitter handle, underscore Dean underscore. Uh, I work for Namshi. I've, thought, I've spoken about Namshi, which is a rocket internet venture. Um, I'm VP of technology there. You can find me blogging and ranting at odino.org. And thanks for listening. <laughs> I, I'll still like just 30 more seconds for you. I have a bonus track. Wow. Uh, what about you? I mean, join us. It doesn't look very appealing, especially because I'm ugly, but whatever. Um, we're looking for senior software engineers. We want to work with uh, Symfony 2, AngularJS, testing speedy and, uh, and stuff like that, okay? We are working like, towards like, cleaning up our architecture, and we're doing it, I think, with pretty, pretty decent tools. We're based in Dubai, which is not that bad. Um, you can go to Namsh.com careers, or you can watch this uh, very nerdy YouTube video where we explain how we work at Namshi. Again, if you have any questions, keep them for yourself. No, I'm kidding. Hello. Um, in my previous job, uh, we were four uh, high skills developers. Okay. And uh, we have, um, like uh, many uh, jobs, uh, some uh, fun, uh, fun jobs and shitty uh, jobs. But uh, no one wants to do uh, cheaty jobs, and uh, four guys want to do uh, fun Absolutely. jobs. How do you uh, handle this? Uh, rotation, that's it. I, I do that. Like, what I, sh what, I, what I learned from my manager, uh, which is one of the managing directors, he comes from Google, he was an engineer at Google before. He does all the bug reports. If, if there is anything to verify, he, he looks at that, okay? So I learned from him that I want to get my hands dirty because my team has to learn that we, everyone has to, has to get his hands dirty. That's how you do it. You just show them because then everyone will feel like, oh, Jesus Christ, he's doing all the crappy things and I'm doing like the, the good part, the fun part. I'm having fun. And it's not fair. If they don't, if they don't, uh, if they don't get it, say goodbye. Because it, it means that they don't want to share those responsibilities, which is not cool. I mean, of course, everyone will have will want to do the, the nice things. Like, some of us have to work on Angular, some of us have to work too with Zen Framework 1. And yeah, it's very easy to pick up like one of the two things, right? What you do is just rotation. It's uh, the fairest uh, option uh, available. Thank you. How do you cope with uh, failure? I mean, project failure, human failure? Business failure, infrastructure failure. Uh, post mortem, it means that after something gets really screwed up, you not immediately after that. You first fix it. You first fix it, and then you just go like, okay, let's have a meeting in one week. Uh, let's note down what went wrong, and let's meet in two days, three days, and let's uh, think of it. Uh, that's the only thing. You don't blame, right? Because if I get blamed for my job, I spend like an endless amount of time, and I love my job. And if I get blamed for that, it's going to be like super demotivating. And that's the same thing for the guys, right? I mean, it's not that they want to screw up in, on purpose. So you just, you just uh, bring, it, uh, bring it down with evidences. So you screwed it up because of this. So just don't do it twice. I mean, it might happen. Like even my boss tells me, yeah, I mean, you fucked up. But uh, yeah, I really know you didn't want to. So you always have to, to see the trade-off between having someone that pushes so much 
and makes mistakes. It's normal, like mistakes are normal. Like the OS 360, the project that I was talking about with Ferry Brooks, 1, 000, almost 1,000 architects, and it sucked, okay? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter, it doesn't mean that those people were stupid or dumb, okay? It just means that sometimes things can fail. Even the best one fail. We, like even Amazon, like with Amazon, we're using AWS in production, right? Sometimes running things like the ELB fucks up, like um, storage uh, goes down. Uh, yeah, it might happen, but at the end of the day, why would, you, why would you blame them? They provide a very good service. You talk with them, you, you tell them, okay, look guys, we had, a, we had an ELB that is not responding, a load balancer that is like funky. Uh, what's happening? But you don't just go there like, oh, you bitches, you don't, nothing works, and so on. It's just you have to, you always have to consider like what's the trade off uh, of having something that usually performs and sometimes makes some mistakes. Never blame, that's the first rule. Because you want people to be committed and to be motivated next time. You don't want them to fear to make that mistake again. You want them to actually realize that they made something stupid or silly and they did not, not gonna do it uh, twice. Thanks. Hi. Uh, you said at the beginning that it was really hard to hire uh, good skilled people yeah. uh, in Dubai. So at the end of uh, your experience, do you think it's better to go in Dubai and spend more time to, uh, to train people or to stay maybe in the US or in Europe and have uh, better skilled people? It's not that the US is any better in general. If you look at Silicon Valley, the problem that they have is that they can't get talent because of visas. Okay? It's like the average US developer, yeah, compared to the Asian people, Probably is better because like there, there is less culture like on a on, on a big scale about projects and like you know frameworks have come later, much later on. Uh, at the end of the day, my experience didn't uh, didn't end up, uh, and I would like to stay there for very long because uh, it's a pretty solid and good uh, and good situation. What we would like to do is, of course, bring uh, some new talent there. Um, and I can tell you, it's one of the most rewarding things to just look at people that were working with WordPress till the other day and seeing that you actually have changed their careers, because you've showed them how the doctrine migration works. It's kind of something very silly, but it's just how like, migration should be done with versioning and so on. And they're just like, oh, okay. If it wasn't for you, I would have never seen like this stuff. I know that it has to work like this, but if no one shows me, it's very difficult. So it's very rewarding to actually train and teach people. And I will tell you, well, the last hire that we've made, uh, no, the, the second last hire that we've made is a fresh graduate from, uh, from uh, one of the universities in, uh, in Dubai. And it's amazing, because he doesn't know anything, and he has seen AngularJS and Symfony 2 as their first things in his, in his professional career. For him, it's like, uh, it's super amazing. It's like, it takes no time, it has no bias, it understands perfectly when things need to be done in a certain way, when he's making mistakes, because right now, his mindset is the mindset that a Symfony 2 developer has always had. It's easy, there is no bias, it's not polluted. Uh, so yeah, I would, I would still, like, what I would recommend for hiring is like, either you get like very young people, but you need the, mem the, the time to train them, of course, to just spend some time with them there and tell them, oh look, this is PHP, open parentheses and so on. And, uh, and, uh, and very skilled guys. Like people in the mid of that, it's kind of uh, harder to work with them because they have bias and it's, it's gonna be like very to change their mindset. I mean, not that you cannot do it, uh, it's, it's just a little bit harder. Okay, thanks. Last question? No? Thank you. Good. Just another one question. Um, a lot of, uh, of what we said is, uh, is okay for startup environment, but um, in big, big business, big uh, society, big enterprise, it's, <laughs> yeah. um, it's not as easy uh, as you say. Um, okay, or can we uh, learn from, uh, from what you say, but apply this in bigger enterprise? My biggest blast is to have a manager that comes from Google. I was an engineer there. Uh, so he's one of the managing directors, and it's very easy because he has the business side of it, but he's an engineer. He has an engineering background. So what I would say, yeah, get a good boss. <laughs> uh, that's too easy. Uh, 
We have TV commercials, so it's not that we're small, right? We have TV commercials going on in, the, in Dubai and so on. We have banners on the, on, on, on the streets, so it's not that it's like a very small company. It's not. It's 200 people. It's not like a, a thousand people company. But what I would tell you is like start very with a lot of humility. What I did first, like in my first interviews with everyone in the team, I came there, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna get all the people together and one-on-one uh, -on -one and just talk with them. And I told them, in one week, we're gonna test everything, automate the test, because that's what I really like. Yeah, it never happened. It took a year to go there. But one of the first things that we did is like, okay, let's introduce monologue, let's use the simply two components. Let's just dig a little bit of that monster away and, uh, and go ahead with it, and, uh, and let's try to make it a little bit better. So you bring your background there, but you can't really pretend that, that you're gonna change everything. Because it's not right, you know? Because we have a product that works. Worse, it can be better, but it doesn't mean that it's shit, right? Because we're selling products, in our case. Or in your case, it might be because we're, we're having page views. Uh, if it works, you can't really blame it. 100%. You can change it, and that's what you have to do. You just change parts of the application. Uh, that's why I would recommend to, if you have like that kind of size uh, project, SOA, like all the, like it's a, it's a decision that I will repeat 100 times, 100%. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a book for the, for the best kitchen. Um, okay. I think that guy over there uh, who, who asked me, yeah. Yeah, as I said, if you want to ping me, if you want to work in a warm environment, uh, I'll be here at the conference uh, until like 3 or 4 p.m. If you want to catch up, it's Dubai. It's a very good experience. Uh, again, thank you for listening. Thank you.